And we are live. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Happy Monday to you. It is a great Monday morning because we've got some really good news for you. And that is that the IDF uh, managed to rescue two hostages last night out of Rafa in Gaza after an amazing and very dramatic uh, operation. I just wanted to start out with that. And uh, let me start out by showing you uh, the, the, so here's where this happened. Let's talk about this. I'm going to go through this quick and I'm going to go through it again. Good morning, everybody. Uh, please uh, go ahead and post where you're coming in from. Uh, that helps YouTube know that a lot of people are watching and they will go out and show it to more people. <clears throat> so uh, that's, that's great. Good morning everybody. Uh, very good to see you. Now, um, I wanted to show you first where this happened. Uh, I've made a little map here. So this is Gaza, as you can see. And if we zoom in here, we'll zoom in on Rafa down in the south. Rafa is the furthest south city in Gaza. Now, I want to point something out to you. You've been told that this is the, you know, that Gaza is the most heavily populated place on earth. That's not true. Actually, if you look here, you'll see all these white, uh, long white uh, buildings. These are actually greenhouses. Uh, so this is kind of a farming community here. You see here as we scroll around, uh, this, these greenhouses everywhere and lots and lots of trees. Uh, those are fruit trees and things like that. And so uh, you're talking about uh, not a super heavily populated area before the invasion, but now, uh, of course, it is very heavily populated because you've got the entire population of Gaza squeezed into Rafa down there. And the IDF is working very hard to try to give them ways to get out, uh, to go to safe zones so that they can go in and do operations in Rafa. Um, Here's what, uh, you know, you've heard me say over and over again that it's not likely that they're going to find many uh, hostages alive and rescue many hostages alive. This is a, a, a very exciting day. This is a very exciting operation. Um, look, I, when I was in the Rangers, I don't, maybe you don't know that much about me, but uh, I spent four years in the U.S. Army Rangers. Uh, back in the 80s and 90s, so a uh, hundred years ago. And, you know, the Rangers are the Army's premier uh, light infantry unit. They're a, a tier one unit, which puts them on, uh, on par with uh, like SEAL Team 6, uh, Delta Force, or other tier, tier one units. And each special operations unit has its own specialty. And so um, in the U.S. military, the, the unit that has the specialty of rescuing hostages is called Delta Force. It's part of the Green Berets, and the, the actual full name of it is the 1st Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta, S-F-O-D Delta. Um, now, they do change the name from time to time, but that's kind of the official name uh, for Delta. Now, Delta Force warriors are literally the top tier special operations unit on the planet. Uh, these guys go through an unbelievably rigorous uh, selection process in the United States. Uh, any uh, branch of the military can try out for Delta Force, not just the Army, even though it's an Army unit. And uh, for every 2,000 people that try out, they take... Uh, two, I'm told. Uh, one or two uh, actually make it into the unit. Once they make it into the unit, then they go through a training process that would blow your mind. These guys literally fire up to a million rounds a year. Uh, and they get so good at uh, shooting because if your job is to rescue hostages, uh, then what, <laughs> I mean, you've, that that's, the most difficult operation you could do because it's normally going to be in an urban environment, which already is the most difficult uh, environment for combat. 
it's going to be uh, in a place where there are good guys and bad guys mixed together very, very closely. Most likely the hostages are going to be guarded. And um, so there are uh, just microseconds to be... Um, uh, you know, to, to, to differentiate when, when these Delta Force operatives come into a room, they've got to differentiate between good guys and bad guys, and they've got to be able to shoot the bad guys without shooting the good guys. And that is unbelievably difficult. And so again, they shoot like a million rounds a year practicing this. You can imagine how good they, they get where that weapon is just an extension of their body. And they, what they do at the end is, uh, like for a graduation exercise, I don't know if they do this anymore. They, did, they used to do this back in the day. They would uh, take one of the members of the unit and sit him in a room, and they would paste three by five note cards all around him, all over on the walls and you know everywhere. And his teammates would have to come in and put a bullet in each one of those three by five cards, live rounds without putting a bullet into their, their buddy. Uh, so you can imagine that the amount of practice that they must do to get that good. Well, I don't know if the shin bet does that kind of training, but I know that they are very highly trained. And uh, as a matter of fact, they, when they went in on this mission last night, uh, they apparently killed something like 62 Palestinians in the process. Now, uh, the AP, which is notoriously anti-Israel, pro-Hamas, uh, is reporting that some of those uh, 62 or 60-something 60 uh, people, the Palestinians who were killed, were women and children. Well, I can promise you that if they were women and children, they were in very close proximity to uh, either the hostages themselves or to people who were shooting at the Shin Bet operatives as they were uh, coming in or leaving, okay? Uh, and actually, I'm uh, reading here uh, that the majority of the fighting that took place uh, in this operation actually took place um, after they had rescued the hostages and they were on their way out uh, to the helicopters to take off. Now, I have uh, some uh, footage of the helicopters here coming in. Uh, and this is on the way after they rescued them as they're coming in to the, uh, I'll, I'll do that again. Uh, that That's a very short clip, but it just shows them coming in uh, back to base with the successful hostages on board. Now, um, so the, the word is that the head of the Shin Bet and the chief of staff directed the operation to rescue these hostages uh, from uh, the, you know, kind of war room. And I think I've got some footage here of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, Yov Gallant uh, in here in the situation room watching the uh, operation as it took place. They had received the word about this operation well in advance, like maybe a week or two ago, actually. Uh, let's see here if I can go back uh, to the information I got about that. Um, let's see here. So there's a, a lot of, uh, of course, a lot of confusion at the beginning of these things uh, and the information's coming out as we, uh, as we speak here. The rescue operation took 45 minutes. Uh, the two hostages were hugged by the fighters who carried them out of the building under fire to a safe zone. This is from Amir Tsafrati. Uh, um, he said, most of the fire that came in was after the rescue to secure the safe arrival to the Black Hawk helicopter. Uh, that they took them out in. Again, um, this is the helicopter here. Uh, and so the helicopter may have been shot at, but it was not damaged apparently uh, enough to make it, uh, you know, crash or anything like that. Uh, so they began by uh, performing airstrikes in the area around where these hostages were. And uh, they at least... 
50 terror targets were attacked in Rafah, over 60 terrorists killed, and hundreds more wounded. This is the last stronghold of Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Um, so this, this happened in the middle of the night. Uh, it, it began at 1 a.m. It took weeks of preparation, training. Uh, when they do training for a mission like this, let me just explain to you how this goes because I've done training for missions like this. And uh, I can tell you that this is not just something where they go, hey, we think we found some hostages, jump in the aircraft. And they just jump in the helicopter and run off and land and then go looking around for the hostages. No, they get very good, very close intelligence. And uh, they are, um, they, they, they mo figure out the building that they're being held in. They model uh, that building. In some cases, like some of the ones that I was on, they literally built scale model mock-ups of the building out of plywood. And they, um, you know, in, in building these, these mock-ups, I mean, it's down to the inch. And that way they have the, you know, plans for the inside. So uh, the operatives, the, the special operations guys, they practice on this building over and over and over and over again, going in and uh, so that they just can do it in their sleep. Uh, there are times when I was training for missions like this, where we would literally start with a, a mock-up that was made out of engineer tape, just uh, put on the ground in the shape of the building. Then we would move to an actual mock-up of the building uh, someplace, and we would hit that building over and over and over again, uh, like probably 15, 20 times. And then the last time we would do it with live ammunition. Uh, then, you know, you're waiting around. After that, you're, you're kind of just waiting and you continue to train, 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 train uh, until you get the go ahead from hire to actually do the mission. I'll tell you about one that I did here shortly. But so it's uh, the operation, the actual operation was given the go ahead. Uh, last night, the operation began about 1 a.m. Um, they, the, they have a, a special operations helicopter force, kind of like the United States has Task Force 160. In uh, Israel, the IDF, it's called Mobility Unit 5515. And they brought the Shin Bet into that neighborhood. They're called, it's called the Shabura neighborhood in Rafah. Uh, at the same time, at the Israeli Air Force was attacking dozens of nearby targets. The force came down from the roof and detonated a bomb, a, 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 an explosive, to breach the door um, on the second floor. So this is a very common way to do this. You either bring in a small helicopter and land on the roof, or you, yeah, <laughs> helicopters don't fly, they beat the air into submission. Hua. Um, they you bring like a very small helicopter, land on the roof, or you bring like a Black Hawk and you hover over the roof and either jump out or fast rope down onto the rope, on, onto the roof. Now, a fast rope is different than rappelling. A rappelling rope is about this big around. You have a harness on, you have a, a carabiner that snaps into the rope and you jump out, you slide down the rope and then you have to slide off the end of the rope to get yourself off and you still got this uh, the, you know, harness on with the carabiner and everything. Uh, fast roping is much quicker, as the name implies, because it's a very large rope, about this big around. And uh, what they do is they, they hover over the target. They drop that rope out. It's connected to a like a pipe that extends out from the helicopter about three or four feet um, and creates kind of a temporary fireman's pole, if you can imagine. Uh, and so then the operator, operators, they don't have to hook into anything. They just swing their weapon around uh, behind their back. They jump out, they grab the rope with gloves on, and they clamp their feet on the rope, and they slide right down the rope like you would a fireman pole. I have done this hundreds of times. Uh, when, when we were doing this back in the 1980s, it had never been tried in combat uh, until uh, the invasion of Panama. And... Um, it is a much faster way to get a helicopter full of guys on the ground, uh, much safer for the aircraft, as you can imagine. Once all of the guys get on the rooftop or on the ground, then the pilot of, or, or the crew chief of the helicopter 
has a lever that he pulls that pulls a pin that then opens a gate and drops that rope down onto the roof. Now that won't work unless there's no more weight on the rope. And so if there's a guy still halfway down, he can't release that. Uh, and otherwise the guy would, would, you know, plummet to his death. Um, and that makes it a very risky operation because if that rope gets caught up in something and, and the helicopter can't get free of it, the helicopter's basically stuck there until they can get that rope free. And I have had that happen in training one time, almost crashed the helicopter. Uh, but so uh, there were, Amy uh, is asking how many were rescued. There were two people rescued. And I have a uh, video of the uh, reunion at the hospital uh, after they were rescued. But first I want to, uh, uh, so the, the names of the abductees are, uh, let me see here. Okay, so let me let me go through the, the rescue operation first. Again, started at 1 a.m. Um, they went into the Shabura neighborhood with a helicopter. The Air Force was attacking dozens of nearby targets to keep the enemy busy. The force came in on, a, on the rooftop and jumped down on the roof, got, got onto the rooftop. It doesn't say if they fast roped or if they just landed. Um, probably they fast roped, if I had to guess. Then they used an explosive to breach the door of the second floor. They killed the Hamas guards and picked up the two abductees. Additional Hamas gunmen fired at them from nearby buildings, but the IDF fighters deployed in the street fired at them in a battle that lasted for a, an hour. Uh, the evacuation to a safe airstrip outside the neighborhood involved the participation of the 7th Brigade tanks and massive fire from the Air Force. The helicopter uh, brought the two uh, uh, hostages back to Sheba Hospital safely where their relatives were waiting for them. Uh, hallelujah. The two hostages that were rescued are um, uh, Luis Har, uh, age 70, and Fernando Simon Marman, age 60. Um, now, uh, the, the, um, the thing I wanted to point out here is that it wasn't just the guys on the helicopter that came in and landed and went and got the, re the rescuers. That's not how these missions go. When there is a, a hostage situation, you have to secure the perimeter. You have to secure the area around the building. Um, and there was a, a, a lot more IDF soldiers that were at risk that had to go in there on the ground. And we're talking about driving now uh, they had to go on the ground and they had to set up a perimeter around the building so that they could fight back against any quick reaction force from Hamas that would have come in. Um, and uh, that is in the United States military. That's what the Army Rangers do. That's what my unit did. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Black Hawk Down, that was my unit. Uh, and that's exactly what we do is we uh, assist units like Delta Force. Delta being the specialists in going into the buildings and rescuing the hostages, uh, the Rangers come in and set up a perimeter to protect Delta Force while they are in the building getting the hostages. And that's exactly what happened in Mogadishu back in uh, 1991. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, 1993. And um, uh, that is what the Rangers did at that time. And that's what this unit uh, of the 7th Brigade did here. And so think about that. In the process, think about the delicate dance that had to take place here uh, for all of the things to go right um, uh, and for, for this to work. So not only do you have a, a helicopter that has to go in and, and land on the roof, but you've got to keep everybody around that building busy enough that they're not going to shoot down that helicopter because helicopters are low and slow moving objects, very easy to shoot down with an RPG or even small arms if you hit the place right or hit the hit the pilots. And so they've got to, they, the, the Air Force has to be involved, but they've got to be able to hit very close to that building without 
hitting the helicopter or the soldiers that are on the ground or the soldiers going into the building. So you imagine just how coordinated this has to be, the incredible amount of training and planning and preparation that has to go into this. At the same time, those ground forces have got to make their way through hostile territory to get into the area where the target building is. And that target building is... Uh, you know, obviously surrounded by bad guys, heavily guarded because there are, there are, uh, uh, you know, uh, hostages in there. So it's going to be heavily guarded. And so they've got to probably get in there, fight their way in perhaps, set up a perimeter around the building, hold off the bad guys for, in this case, an hour or more and keep them because as soon as all uh, you know, the, the helicopter comes in, all heck is going to break loose. Every Hamas fighter in the area is going to come running to try to stop this uh, operation from happening. And so uh, it was unbelievably well coordinated, well planned, but also super risky. Uh, and because it's so risky, um, that's one of the reasons why it is you just don't see it happen a whole lot. OK, um, so. The uh, the AP, as I said, is is saying, oh, wait, before before I tell you that, I want to show you um, the the reunion here. Uh, this is the air, aircraft coming in and landing uh, with the hostages on it. And here are the hostages at the hospital. And is that if that doesn't. And here, and here are the hostages, hostages at the hospital, hospital and I tell you, if that, that doesn't bring a tear to your eye, I don't know what will. Um, it's just, just they, they, they look to be in good condition, uh, a little gaunt, perhaps. Uh, they've been in captivity for four months. Both of these uh, hostages were captured from the near Oz uh, kibbutz, uh, if I remember right. And... Uh, the, uh, apparently, apparently, the, the way, way that, that they, they found uh, these hostages uh, or found out where they were was, was from interrogating the uh, some, some some of the Hezbollah, or, I'm sorry, Hamas fighters, fighters that they had captured. captured. So, so, man, if, if that, that doesn't make the tears well up in your eyes, eyes I don't know what will. That is just absolutely fantastic. fantastic. Uh, uh, just, just so great to see um, some. some some, some hostages, hostages actually being rescued. rescued. The, the, the hostages uh, were rescued for uh, the, the entire operation to get the hostages out. Took, took about 45 minutes on the ground, ground and the um, firefight went on longer than that uh, so that the ground forces that were there to protect them could get out. When you started the video, you have a terrible echo in your microphone. Oh, I do. Okay. All right. Let me try that again. Let's just try this video again. Okay, okay, so, so do, do we, we still, still have an echo? echo? Oh, oh yeah, yeah okay, that's, that's why. why. Okay, there we go. Uh, I just had to turn off. I had two microphones going. Uh, if this doesn't bring tears to your eyes, folks, I don't know what will. If that doesn't, uh, if that doesn't just just jerk at your heartstrings. This is the footage of the two families um, meeting their loved ones at the hospital, Sheba Hospital. Uh, for the first time after they were brought back. Uh, you can imagine what a sweet reunion this must have been. What an incredible reunion. Um, man, so cool. Just so awesome. Man, you gotta, you gotta love that, don't you? Okay, so um, just to reiterate, uh, we've had two hostages rescued last night in a daring operation into the town of Rafa in the south. I'll show you the map again. Here's the map of Gaza. Um, and if we zoom in here on Rafa in the south, uh, you can see just south of Han Yunus. And again, I want to point out that this is not a heavily built up area. They keep telling you that, that uh, the, the area uh, of Gaza is the most heavily populated area on earth. That is not true. Uh, if we look here, all of these long white buildings are 
uh, greenhouses. These are not apartment complexes. These are greenhouses. This is a farming area. You can see a lot of orchards here. You can see a lot of uh, fruit trees, a lot of open ground. Uh, now, of course, this is very crowded. I see a lot of mosques as well. Uh, this is very crowded area. Uh, and it's crowded because uh, all of the people in Gaza are essentially crammed into Rafah now. Uh, and it is... Uh, the, the, the IDF is doing operations in Rafa, and get this. I mean, this is the, the thing that is just mind-boggling to me. The U.S., the, the, the Biden administration is so angry at the Israelis for conducting operations in Rafa. They're telling them, I mean, the, the Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, um, Anthony Blinken, and even Joe Biden is saying they should not be doing operations in Gaza, in uh, Rafah. Uh, it's too crowded. They cannot do this. And they're, they're pushing them so hard. And yet now we see why they're doing these operations. Now, the other thing I wanted to point out, uh, again, the AP is reporting that 60 more than 60 people were killed. They say some of them were children. Of course, uh, they got that information from the Hamas-owned uh, health administration in Gaza. Uh, so that you have to take their word with a grain of salt. However, uh, they also count uh, people that are under 21 as children. And so there are many Hamas fighters who are under 21. Uh, and so if they got killed fighting, uh, you know, if they're in that area, there's a lot of fighting going on. It's not like there's just people wandering around. If there's a firefight happening, you, what would you do? If there's bullets flying everywhere, you're going to get out of the area. You're going to take cover. Okay. So if you're getting hit by, um, if you're getting hit by uh, fire, if there's, there's, you know, bullets flying everywhere, um, then you're getting shot. Well, obviously you are there for a reason. And uh, so the vast majority of the people that were killed were likely engaged with the IDF fighting them. Um, but if they were not, what that tells us is that they were in very close proximity to hostages and there's no way they could have not known that those hostages were there because there would have been a tremendous amount of guards or you know Hamas activity around there the the guards would have had to be getting them food procur procuring them food medicine things like that taking it back and forth to them what we have found from other hostages that were uh, released eventually uh, was that most of these hostages are spread out all over the place in ones and twos, and they're being housed by actual families, by civilian families in Gaza. What happens is Hamas brings a hostage to a family and says, you hang on to this guy, make sure he doesn't escape or your family gets killed. And, um, you know, we won't kill your family as long as you, you keep, him, keep him alive. So those people are engaged, involved in this. Um, and so if, look, if there were 60 plus people killed, um, the vast majority, I'm talking about the vast majority of those people, 90 plus percent of those people were engaged or involved in this, uh, in keeping these hostages in some way, shape or form. Uh, the IDF is not going to just randomly go in and start shooting civilians. And you imagine, you know, the, the way that the, uh, the AP reports it, what you get the sense that the, there were women pushing their baby carriages and the IDF showed up and just shot them. Uh, that's not happening. Um, so uh, the IDF is taking great pains to give civilians in Rafa places to go where they can be safe. And um, those places are... Uh, uh, I sh I'm showing, I'm blowing out my microphone. So I'm, those places are um, far away from the fighting, uh, except for the times when the Hamas fighters go into those safe zones and then shoot at the IDF from those zones, which happens all the time, all the time. Uh, those, uh, obviously Hamas wants civilians to be killed 
because that's how they bring pressure to bear on the IDF and on Israel, um, you know, to, to stop the fighting. They want many civilian deaths. And so when there are civilian deaths, they make a big deal out of them. And when there aren't civilian deaths, they make them up. And we've seen many cases of that um, uh, where, where they literally uh, faked dead people. There are dead people that are, you know, wrapped up in their white sh shrouds like they're ready to be buried. And you see them moving around or you see them in, in there on their cell phones or something. Um, there have been lot, lots of leaked footage that's come, come out about that. Um, so, but remember, they're not just, they're not playing to an, uh, the IDF. They're not playing to an Israeli audience. They're playing to um, gullible people in the West. Uh, they're playing to the UN um, and that sort of thing. And they're playing to their own constituency in Gaza and in the Middle East to try to whip up sentiments against Israel. Now, uh, one thing that you'll notice when you look at Gaza here, as I'll show you this map again, is this Rafa crossing is uh, very, it's right, I, I mean, it's a crossing. It's, it's the border crossing down here uh, with Egypt. And Egypt has warned Israel not to go into Rafa and do operations there because they say that they will uh, negate or they will suspend the, uh, uh, the uh, Camp David Accords, which is the um, treaty that they made with, uh, with Israel, the peace treaty that they made with Israel, that, that uh, Egypt is threatening that they're going to start moving troops into this area, um, uh, moving you know, troops that they have agreed not to put in the area around the border, like tanks and armor and stuff like that and move that into the, the area around the border and perhaps even, uh, uh, you know, go so far as to attack Israel. Um, that is a, a threat on the part of the, uh, the, the Egyptians. And um, this, again, ramping up the pressure on Israel not to go into Rafah, but uh, Israel all this time, for the last couple of weeks, as they've announced these uh, operations that were going to start going into Gaza, all this time, they knew that those hostages were there and they were planning the operations to get them out. Now, I have to point this out as, you know, and again, I don't want to throw cold water on this. This is a joyous day. This is a, a an amazing operation. Very uh, brave, very bold um, uh, you know, operation by the special operations forces, the Shin Bat of the IDF and everyone involved. Uh, but every time you do this, so they've got two guys out. Every time you do this, the situation gets more difficult for the rest of the hostages because they're going to double and triple the security on all the rest of the hostages uh, because they don't want this. Uh, Hamas doesn't want this to happen again. Uh, this is the most valuable asset that Hamas has, are these hostages. And they're going to do everything within their power to protect them and keep them from being captured. Now, um, they are finding, uh, part of the reason that Egypt does not want the IDF to go into Rafah is likely because they will find the smuggling tunnels and destroy them that allow people in Egypt to do business with people in Gaza by smuggling items through these tunnels. And, um, you know, those tunnels are not supposed to be there by the treaty. Uh, they are illegal, uh, but we know they exist. We know they're used to smuggle all sorts of things in and out of Gaza, including people. And so what that could very well mean is that this is going to be a, um, a hit to the economy of that part of, of Egypt uh, because there are a lot of people who rely on that smuggling for their livelihoods. And if the IDF goes in there and blows up all those tunnels, that's going to make it very difficult for them to do business. Uh, so what that says is um, this, uh, this actually needs to be done. Uh, the IDF needs to go in there and do this. And so the more the Egyptians whine and cry about them doing it, the more the IDF knows they have to do it. 
Does that make sense? Okay, so I want to go back and um, uh, hang on a second. I've got to uh, answer a uh, request here for another live. Uh, and so, uh, oh, um, looks like there's a comment or a question from, uh, let's see, Ironwood Workman wonders why they look so clean. Uh, and other people have asked that question. I would, I, I would venture to say that they allowed the hostages to clean up um, before their families got there, before their families came in. We don't, I don't know that for sure, but uh, that's a you know, scientific guess, <laughs> you know, just the way these things work. Uh, again, we'll go down here and we'll look at the footage of that. Absolutely amazing. Um, and these guys, they, they do. They look like they're in fairly good condition. Uh, thank God. Thank God for that. Uh, but again, these are very, very valuable assets to uh, Hamas. And so they have a vested interest in keeping them alive, uh, keeping them in good shape because they, they're using them as bargaining chips. You can, uh, man, just what, that just tears at my heartstrings every time. If you can imagine having not known whether you would ever see your loved one again for four months plus and thinking that they would probably not survive. And now all of a sudden they've been given a new lease on life. I tell you what, if I was that guy, I would think that every day after that is just a gift. And every one of us should think that anyway. Um, so uh, Manuel Gomez asks, is Egypt not bluffing with Israel? Um, well, I don't, I don't know that they're bluffing, but again, I think that they are very concerned about two things. Number one, they're very concerned that if Israel goes into Rafah and really starts major operations there, that it will push tens or even hundreds of thousands of uh, Palestinians to break down the wall between... You imagine right now, the Egyptians have built up not one, but two walls uh, back to back to keep the Palestinians out of Egypt. And these are walls that put the Trump wall on the southern border to shame. These walls uh, have tons of barbed wire, uh, concertina wire. I mean, they, they are massive, right? And can you imagine what would happen if somebody got a hold of a bulldozer and just knocked over those walls and hundreds of thousands of Palestinians started flooding into Egypt? Egypt would be very, very unhappy about that. They've had a tremendous, for, for two reasons. Number one, uh, they've had a tremendous amount of trouble with the Muslim Brotherhood, which is Palestinian uh, related, and lots of terror attacks and things like that in Egypt from Palestinians. So they don't like the Palestinians. And uh, of course, the humanitarian crisis that would descend on Egypt if uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, Palestinians were uh, pushed in there, they would have a really hard time getting them back out again. And so they are warning Israel, like, don't make that, you know, happen. And Israel is saying, don't worry, we're putting up safe zones. They can go back north. And As I said, if you look at the map, you look at all this area out here, uh, this is farming area. There's a lot of open ground out here where people can go. And if you go up uh, between uh, Khan Yunus and Rafa, there's even more open ground. So that, you know, that there's plenty of space to put these people. Um, and the IDF is setting up safe zones where they can go. So it, it should be doable. It's going to be a, a major operation, but it should be doable. Uh, but the other thing that the uh, Egyptians are worried about is, um, I, well, again, the economic hit that, it's, that, that Egyptians are going to take because the IDF is going to find and blow up the uh, smuggling tunnels, which some say are absolutely massive that you can like drive through. Um, so uh, that's, that's a major deal and we'll see how it pans out. But this gives uh, the IDF, th this mission, this successful rescue of hostages in Rafa gives the IDF and the Israeli people all the justification they need to continue doing operations in Rafah until all of their, their uh, 
you know, hostages are either found um, or, or they clear the whole place. Now, obviously, they know that many of those hostages, uh, you know, 30 plus, uh, maybe as many as 60 of those hostages have already been killed or died in captivity. Um, but that still leaves nearly 100 that are, are probably alive. And uh, so that's that's important. I mean, <laughs> I mean that that's a, all the justification they need to keep on fighting. Uh, and this gives the Israelis a much needed boost to uh, you know their their morale. Uh, and so let's uh, go on here. I want to go back and I want to uh, start over again. Unless you've got some questions, how long is the border? from the sea to the Israeli border. Um, I'm not positive about that, but the border here uh, along the Egyptian area is about 25 to 30 miles, I would say, uh, down there. Uh, it, it, the, at its, I think it's about 25 miles. I think that's what I was told at its uh, widest point. Maybe Dan Andros can uh, look that up and send me a WhatsApp and tell me how long it is. But uh, yeah, they. I, I really should go there. That's right. I, I really should. Um, maybe I'll just go to the Egyptian side and see what I can see from that side uh, and, and call it a day because Israel uh, doesn't want to let me in with their troops. Um, did Biden give Israel an ultimatum and timeline to complete the mission? I wouldn't say real estate photography of CDA. I wouldn't say he gave them a ultimatum. They just said, don't go into Rafa. That we don't support that. That would be a bad idea. And uh, Israel's like, uh, well, sorry you feel that way, but we're going into Rafa. And um, again, they have very good reason to do that. Uh, they they knew all along when they were talking about going into Rafa that this was going to take place that, that this this mission was being planned and so that's pretty pretty serious uh, we, we've gotten a bunch of footage out uh, from people in Gaza or in Rafa of the firefights uh, and I didn't have time to put all those up so I could show them to you. But uh, I'll put those up on my uh, website. You can go to chuckholton.com and I will put uh, videos up from the firefight that took place last night in Rafa. Uh, it, there, it, it's pretty spectacular. There was a big fight, a big battle uh, to get these guys out. So let me explain again for those of you just coming on how this worked. Um, the Israelis found out apparently from interrogating uh, some of the Hamas fighters that they had captured, where these people were being held. Now, remember, the Israelis had offered uh, a large reward and uh, I think like $10,000 and um, a, a safe place to live, so safe passage into Israel or someplace safe where they could live, to anybody who gave information about the whereabouts of uh, any of the hostages that led to their uh, being being uh, found. So it could be that somebody came forward, but more, most likely what I'm hearing is that they, under interrogation, some of the Hamas fighters gave up where these two guys were held. They then started planning this operation. This operation is very complex. It, it puts together ground forces, air forces, uh, aviation assets from uh, the the army, which is uh, helicopters, and uh, special operations forces all had to work together. Uh, they started planning this a couple weeks ago. It does take time to put these together because there's a lot of moving parts. Um, the special operations forces had to identify the building, figure out, the, uh, get, a, get the dimensions of the building, figure out what the inside of the building looked like. Where are the guard stations? Where are the uh, hostages being held? Are the hostages mobile or not? Are they, are they injured? Are they sick? Um, and, and, you know, how, what's the easiest way to get to them and get them out of there? Very often, it's not by going through a door. It's by going through a wall. Uh, a, a lot of times in the, the operations that I 
uh, participated in, in when I was in the Rangers back a hundred years ago, we would actually blow a hole into the, the place where the hostages were being held uh, by going through a wall because the doors are the places that are usually booby trapped or have a guard on them or something like that. Uh, so we'd go through a wall uh, and, and try to get them out that way. But They've got to decide all that. They've got to get all the information they can and then figure all that stuff out about the target building. Then they have to figure out what are the disposition of forces around that building and how are we going to keep those guys busy uh, long enough for our special forces to get in, get the hostages, and get out. As I said, if they're going in on a helicopter, those are low and slow and very easy targets. So even at night, a helicopter coming in, uh, on a rooftop can be easily hit with a um, uh, or hit with a, a RPG, an anti-tank missile. They could be hit with uh, uh, even a grenade launcher or small arms, and be taken out. That very difficult. Those helicopters are not armored, at least not much. Uh, some of them have some armor on the floor and around the pilot compartment to try to protect the pilot somewhat. But obviously, you're not going to armor the glass on the front, you know, they, they, they just can't carry that much weight. Um, armor is very heavy. And so they have Kevlar uh, on and they're surrounded with Kevlar, but uh, that is a very, very risky thing to do. I actually flew helicopters uh, after I got out of the Rangers. I spent four years uh, in the Ranger Regiment uh, back in the 80s and 90s and then uh, got tired of sleeping in mud puddles and walking everywhere. So I went to an aviation unit and became an aero scout observer, which meant I was a co-pilot on a uh, OH-58 Kiowa helicopter, which is like a Bell Jet Ranger, basically. And uh, those things are like a sewing machine with doors on it. I mean, they're very, very uh, uh, thin skinned. They're slow moving. They're very easy to shoot down. And uh, those kind of helicopters in, in the special operations world, uh, they use helicopters like that. They, they're usually more of like an MH60. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, um, uh, oh, I just spaced on the, the name there. We called them Little Birds, uh, which are like a Hughes 500 helicopter. Uh, they're kind of like the Bell Jet Ranger, but they have four blades instead of two. So they're a little more powerful. And they have these... Um, these benches on the outside of the helicopter on either either side that are just like kind of like a park bench with little straps on them. And what happens is uh, the special operators run up, you jump on that bench and you just hold on. Uh, you, we usually had a little uh, uh, rope around our waist with a snap link that we would clip into a D-ring on the helicopter. So if we fell off, we wouldn't actually plummet to our deaths because you're not strapped in. You're not inside the helicopter. You're actually sitting on the outside of the helicopter as the helicopter flies at rooftop level, banking left and right all over the place. Uh, and it's very, very fun, I have to say. It's, it's about the most fun I've ever had. Um, but it is, it's very, very risky also, especially at night. And the pilots are flying under night vision and you're coming in to, under fire. This is what they did in Mogadishu uh, back in 1993. In the Black Hawk Down incident, uh, they brought in a bunch of guys on little birds like that. And so we would fly in, they would come in uh, very fast and flare real hard and then set down on the rooftop of the building and we would jump off and they would take off again. So they would only be on the rooftop for a couple of seconds. Uh, the other way that they could get onto the rooftop, I don't know how they did it in this case, um, is they come in with a like a Black Hawk, which is a much larger helicopter, which presents a much bigger target, but they're also uh, they're able to absorb more ground fire. You know, they're, they're a little more hardy and less likely to get shot out of the sky. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a, you know, a, a, a toss up. But the problem with those is that they're often too big to land on a rooftop. So what they can do is they, if the pilot's good enough, they can come down and hover on the, just above the rooftop and the guys try to jump off. Uh, but of course that's, uh, pretty risky, you know, you risk breaking legs and stuff, or they fast rope in, which is a big fat rope about this big around, it's about two inches in diameter, and they throw that rope out, it's about 90 feet long, and they can, or, you know, they can get different lengths, but they, they come and they hover over the rooftop, they throw the rope out, the guys jump out and slide down the rope with gloves on, and then when they hit the, the ground, they, they just jump, jump off and run away, 
once all the operators are on the ground or on the rooftop, the helicopter then drops that rope, just throws it away and flies away. That to get maybe 10 or 12 guys going out both sides of a Black Hawk um, on the ground could take as much as 30 seconds or more. And so obviously the guy's got to hover there, the absolutely sitting duck, a very dangerous uh, time to, uh, to, for a helicopter to be there. Uh, and so they did one of those two things last night. And that's why, uh, according to the sources, uh, the IDF, the Air Force was absolutely wiping out targets all around the target building. They were just hitting everything in sight. Now, I don't know if they brought in, I, I haven't seen on the, the video, I can, I can look here at some of the video. Uh, it looks like, uh, I'm looking at some of the video filmed by Palestinians in Gaza, uh, you know, in Rafa, uh, and we hear um, the, you know, we just hear the fighting, you can't see a whole lot. Um, we see some explosions, some flares in the sky, stuff like that. I was wondering if they had a, um, a Spectre gunship, but I don't see any evidence of that. That's what we would have had if the United States had done this. A Spectre gunship is a C-130 uh, aircraft that flies about 8,000 feet up and just flies lazy circles uh, around the target area. Inside that aircraft, they have three weapon systems. They have a 105 millimeter howitzer, which fires, you know, artillery shells. They have a 40 millimeter chain gun, which fires hand grenades, basically. Uh, you know, it, they're, they're gr grenades, they're rifle grenades, not hand grenades. Um, but it, it, it's like a machine gun that fires grenades. And then they have a, uh, uh, I think it's a 20 millimeter Vulcan cannon, uh, or it might be 30 millimeter Vulcan cannon. Uh, that thing shoots about 5,000 rounds per minute. It can fire depleted uranium uh, bullets or, or explosive shells or, or whatever. But uh, 5,000 rounds a minute is basically like a fire hose of bullets uh, coming down out of the sky. They have very precise targeting systems. They can hit the hood of a certain vehicle while it's in motion. Um, and those things, all they do is they just... They have a little computer system. They put the reticle on the thing they want to obl obliterate and they push the button and then they hear a little beep. And then about 10 seconds later, whatever they were pointing at just gets vaporized. Uh, that uh, 5,000 rounds per minute can put a bullet in every square inch of a football field inside of like four seconds. I mean, it's just like, uh, it's, it's, it's unbelievable the amount of ordnance that they can rain out of the sky. We had them in Panama. We had them uh, in Mogadishu. Or we, we should have had them in Mogadishu, but we didn't. And um, they, they have been a staple of special operations, especially hostage rescue missions, for a long, long time. Because you can imagine those things have giant infrared stadium lights on them. So you can't see it with the naked eye. But as they're flying around at night up there at 8,000 feet, if you've got night vision on, they turn night to day. And uh, so you're you know, on the ground and you're watching this thing. When, when they see bad guys, you just hear this sound that, uh, that sounds like heaven ripping apart, just, Rah! and then you see this uh, fire hose of fire uh, it, because those 30 millimeter uh, uh, Vulcan cannon rounds, uh, every fifth round is a tracer. And there's so many tracers coming down. It just looks like a laser beam coming out of the sky. And they just, it, they just obliterate anything around. So if the Israelis had those, they could, have, uh, they could have definitely employed them last night. But I don't see any evidence of that. Uh, and I don't know that the Israelis actually have any uh, Volcom cannons. Um, Linda Osborne asks, if any IDF were harmed, um, uh, we don't have any news about uh, any, at least I haven't seen any news about any injuries in that uh, operation. And if the IDF did that without any injuries, that makes it even that much more amazing. Um, there have been, there, there is some footage that was just now released uh, after I went live just a, a, about 20 minutes ago of the operation. 
Uh, and so uh, I'm going to put that inf th that footage up on my, uh, well, here, I, I'll just show you some here. Uh, I'm going to just watch it here. This is footage of the buildings around the target building being hit by IDF Air Force. Uh, so that's that's what they've released so far. That was a missile. Uh, if you look here at the beginning, you can actually see the missile come in from the side of the screen there. You can see it come in and hit. Um, yeah, that's pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, so very good mission, a joyful day in Israel. Um, question from Tracy, any word from Hirsch? Any word on Hirsch? Uh, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, so probably not. Um, Hirsch may be one of the, uh, one of the hostages, but uh, I have not heard anything specific uh, from them. Um, Let's see if there's any other questions here. Uh, oh, you, you're talking about the baby, maybe. Uh, I have not seen. So is this not an answer to prayer, folks? Uh, Sandy Long says, do they know where other hostages are yet? Well, if they do, they're not going to tell us. Um, they didn't tell us before they found these ones, and this is why. If they put the word out that they know where hostages are, then they are warning the Hamas fighters uh, that they're coming. And uh, they're giving the Hamas fighters the chance to move them, kill them, or uh, double the guards on them and make it that much harder to rescue them. So if they do know where any of these hostages are, they are certainly not going to put out the word that they know where they are. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is an uh, incredible answer to prayer, and I think we should all take a moment to thank God for uh, answering our prayers, to put His angels around the IDF, protect them, to give them wisdom and discernment, and to, to rescue these hostages, to bring these hostages home. Uh, let's uh, take a look here again one last time at the incredible joy of uh, these families being reunited at the hospital in Israel. That just blows me away. That just blows me away. That's so beautiful. Uh, so, folks, I think that the most appropriate thing we can do right now is to just take a moment and pray and thank God for allowing these hostages to get out. So let's do that. Lord Jesus, I just pray right now uh, and, and thank you and praise you, Father, for what you have done today in Israel, for giving the Israeli people that boost of morale that they need to keep up the fight, to let them know that you are with them, to make yourself known among the people, not just the Israelis, but among the, the people in Gaza as well, to let um, these hostages free. Father, we pray that you would do this again and again and again until they all come out. We pray that you would be glorified in every instance, Father. We pray that you would, uh, you would get the credit for these answered prayers, that the Israelis themselves would cry out to Hashem, they would cry out to God, and they would, they would bless your name, Father. Uh, Lord, we pray that this war would be over quickly. We pray that there would not be any significant escalation from Egypt, from Hezbollah in the north, from Syria. We know that the IDF is striking Damascus even now. Lord, we pray that the enemies of Israel would be defeated and that there would be peace in Jerusalem, Lord. Father, we're so grateful to, to you for all that you do for us. We're grateful for this technology that we can come together and we can join together in prayer. And we know, Lord, that the, that the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So help us to be righteous, Lord. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Okay, folks, thank you very much for watching. We really appreciate you. Uh, you can find out more about, I'm going to be doing more lives today on my own channel uh, over at 
the hot zone here on YouTube. So you can go over there and subscribe and be notified when I go live. I'm going to be doing uh, lives, uh, another live today about the sh recent shooting that w took place at Joel Osteen's church, Lakewood Church. And uh, the, so the, the, the church shooting, we're going to be doing that with Tim Miller, uh, the former Secret Service agent, the security expert who does training for churches on how to keep their people safe. And so uh, we live in a dangerous world, folks. Uh, Tim Miller is going to be uh, holding a weekend training at Maple Fork Lodge in Southern West Virginia coming up the second weekend of May. Uh, and, and it's like a three or four day training. It is some of the best training you can get on planet Earth for its tactical crisis preparation training. It's going to be shooting. It's going to be talking about the legalities uh, that, that go along with uh, having to protect yourself. It's going to be talking about de-escalation. It's going to be talking about preparing your house, uh, making your home, your fortress, uh, in increasing your own personal security for you and your family. And he's going to have some of the, if you want to meet some of the Delta Force operatives who took part in the rescue operations in, uh, in Mogadishu, Somalia back in 1993, uh, they will likely have some of them there as instructors at that course. And so if you want to come hang out with Delta Force and learn from those guys for a weekend, uh, it is some of the best training you can possibly get. I highly recommend that you go. Uh, you can find out more about that by you know, just sending me an email. You can go to, uh, just send me an email at hotzoneholton at gmail.com, hotzoneholton at gmail.com. It's there in the uh, comments uh, section right now. Uh, so send me an email. If you have any questions or comments about anything we do, do you want to join us on one of our trips to Armenia? Uh, we have a couple of slots open. I think, I think we're, we may be getting, we may be full, uh, but we might have a slot or two left. So we'll see what we can do um, to get you on one of those trips if you want to go. And again, you can go to chuckholton.com and uh, follow all of my reporting there. I'll also be doing some reporting on the uh, bubbling conflict in Guyana today, uh, very soon, uh, coming up on my podcast. So uh, you can uh, also please uh, contribute to CBN. Go to cbn.com and become a partner over there. Uh, this is how we keep our jobs, folks. So uh, we appreciate all of you. Thank you very much. And God bless you. We'll see you again uh, very soon. All right.